Welcome to the Vet Dental Show. I'm Brett Beckman. I'm a board-certified veterinary dentist, and we come to you every week on Wednesday to provide the veterinarian and the technician team some actionable things that you can use in your practice. And this episode is going to be a recorded episode that we've done in the past, not a podcast that we've recorded or not the Vet Dental Show, but actually some other information for you that we know you're going to enjoy. So sit back, enjoy, and we'll see you at the end of the podcast. We've got a question from Megan for feline, feline showing signs of stomatitis under 12 months old. Is there any benefit of waiting before doing full mouth extractions to see if it will improve with digital home care? And that's a multifaceted question. It's a great question. And the first thing we need to take into consideration is this stomatitis. You've got a patient under 12 months of age, and there are two very common conditions that can be confused with feline hyperplastic gingivostomatitis. And those are, set, I'm sorry, feline chronic gingivostomatitis. And those are, as we will show in the keynote here, in some images. So this is the first of those. This is, as I tried to meld the names, feline hyperplastic gingival stomatitis, feline hyperplastic gingivitis. And this condition occurs generally recognized around six months of age. It needs to be differentiated from its very similar condition where we have eruption of the tooth and a little bit of hyperplastic tissue at the time of eruption. So we want to make sure we're not dealing with pericoronitis, which is due to eruption and a little bit of inflammation of that tooth coming through the gum. But if it's persistent, if it's six months, you recheck in a couple of weeks, it's still there. And it's that pronounced like it is in that image where we actually have that tissue growing over the crown of the tooth, then that's pretty consistent with that condition. So we need to differentiate it from that. And there's also some and that looks, so you just take a glance at that, you might think, oh, that's stomatitis. It's very inflamed tissue. And when you biopsy that, it might come back stomatitis because when they're looking at that from a pathology standpoint, they're looking at the plasma cell. And if there's plasma cells in there, they're going to call it stomatitis if it's from a cat. So you can't go by that in any histopath. You have to look at the whole patient. This is another condition, very similar, juvenile onset periodontitis. And this can occur and looks a lot like stomatitis, but it's not stomatitis. This is definitive for feline gingiv chronic gingivostomatitis. This is caudal mucositis. If you look past the maxillary arcade there, the inflammation in that caudal mucosa, that is pathognomonic for stomatitis. And if you have that, the only recommendation is full mouth extractions or caudal mouth extractions in very, but you have to be able in response to this question at 12 months of age, you have to be able to differentiate those. And back to the benefit of waiting, if you can document that, as soon as that's documented, the recommendation for full mouth extractions is on the table either for by referral or if you're extremely experienced in veterinary extractions, then you certainly could handle these in your own practice. But I say very experienced. That means you want to have a lot of experience doing flaps, surgical extractions in cats, and have had wet labs that are focused on technique and focused on you creating the least offensive outcome for that patient. So if you've not done that before and you've only done a couple of extractions for a couple of years in cats here and there, this is not a case for you. There are a lot of situations where you have tooth resorption and you have other problems that need to be addressed. You've got the aftercare for 70 to 80% of these that are refractory to treatment. So you definitely want to make sure that you've got a lot of a lot of support there and referral is your best option in probably 95 percent 
of the cases of individuals that come to our courses, wet labs. So we talk to them directly. We know that's the case. And these are tough cases, very tough. So you have to really consider, am I going to be helping this patient or making it worse? All right. So let's go to the next question. Janie Rodriguez Dufresne, what are the recommendations for these cats as far as the meds before we get them in for extractions and referral? And that's a great question, Janie. A lot of these cats you're not going to be able to do day one. As we talked about CRIs, we, in our practice, get them the same day. But you as the practitioner are going to see these, you're going to recognize them. You can't do them the same day or you can't get referral the same day. So we want to do something that's going to help these patients. The biggest thing that does help is prednisolone and preferably oral prednisolone at reasonable doses, one to two milligrams per kilogram BID to start to really impact that inflammation, really impact their eating if they're not eating, and really impact their discomfort and inflammation in general, <clears throat> and then decrease that into an every other day regimen. You can add anything to that. Gabapentin is a staple for this because it's a chronic, it's for chronic pain. We don't know exactly how that works, but <clears throat> from, from that standpoint for oral pain, but we do feel that it decreases the release from the presynaptic membrane of substance P and some other substances that are causing more frequent and more intense pain to reach the, the cortex from the brainstem. So from that standpoint, gabapentin, prednisolone, orally, we don't like to use depo. Sometimes you have to, but it's not something you want to use multiple times if you have to get this patient where it's comfortable and administration is an issue, then you need to consider that, but that's a very last resort. Other analgesics we've discussed, that would be the recommendation. And once those meds start, once you see that patient for the first time, get these guys started. That's an action step immediately to get these guys started on the road to get to somebody, whether it be you or referral, to get that you know, those extractions done. Melinda, are there any ways to avoid ocular top trauma during nerve blocks. And we'll talk about nerve blocks specifically a little more in some of the cases as we go through. But in cats, the recommendation is to do the infraorbital block, just like you do in dogs for the rostral premolars and the incisors and the canine. You don't go all the way back. You just go right into the foramen just barely into the foramen. You don't do the caudal maxillary block like we do in dogs because that'll put you right at the orbit. And knowing the right technique, and this is from Cathal Rafferty and Cathal, when we use the air water syringe or the air, we do not, we use the air water obviously with our burr and that's to cool the burr when we use the air water syringe. We don't directly put air up into and toward the bone. We want to direct it away. The chances of air embolus are probably little to none, but it has occurred in humans. It has occurred in veterinary patients. So you do want to be careful. With The more common problem would be where we have emphysema, where we get collection of air that traverses the tissue planes and ends up generally going dorsal because air is light. So it goes through the tissue planes and ends up on the top of the head and go to the neck as well. And you get that, that crinkly sound when you pet the patient. You definitely want to let the owner know if you do encounter that. It's very infrequent. We do a lot of cases in our practice and we almost never, and they're all dentistry. And we almost never see that, but when we do, we make sure we let the owner know it's just a, just a side effect complication that's untoward in dentistry, and it's not a big deal. It'll resolve in a couple of days. In the neck, you got to be a little bit more discerning because that could certainly be a tracheal tear. So you want to make sure that you're aware of that and do a little bit more reading on that just to make sure you're not doing anything that might involve tracheal tears, especially in cats. Amelia, Jane, why do you no longer use mental foramen nerve block? And that is because there is a really small 
foramen. You have to use a 25 gauge needle. It's a little bit more difficult. You're putting that agent into a very small space. There has been research done by James Anthony a while back that showed some damage to the nerve and the vasculature from that, although it seems to be minor. It's so much easier to do an extra oral <clears throat> mandibular nerve block on dogs and cats. And from the standpoint, the next question always is, <clears throat> what about biting their tongue? Doesn't exist if the practice is, or if the patient is recovered properly. And by what by recovered properly, what I mean is that they are sternal before they're left unattended. And if you use our light anesthetic techniques, that will not be a problem because a lot of those patients wake up on the table, they're sternal, they may be standing before they're cleaned up and put in the cage, which is less than five minutes. But with that being said, we've got a lot of, lot of evidence that we, we just don't have that as a problem. We don't have that as a problem. It's never happened in our hands. And it's a matter of having that head in lateral recumbency, tongue falls out, dog or cat chews the tongue, and it, it, with or without nerve blocks. But if they're recovered, that's fine. Now, for big cats, for, for my veterinary dental colleagues that are doing big cats, you can't recover those. And they've got that huge, long tongue in lions and leopards and pumas and whatever big cats you're working on, and that hangs out, and you don't want to be in recovery with the hat tat waiting for it to wake up. So they do not do the, the caudal mandibular block in the large cats in zoos and things like that because of that. I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you'd like more information about the Veterinary Dental Practitioners Program, please submit to request an invitation at ivdi.org slash I-N-V.